Good morning, beloved. Peace be with you. Just a little, uh, a little side note. Um, I was telling the altar service last mass, not this mass, but the last one, about a little, an old Catholic tradition, and um, I think it's more like Eastern Catholics, but I've seen it a little bit in some of the different Roman Catholic churches, but it's a good little tradition. Um, did you know that, so there's one tradition that, that teaches and shows and demonstrates that basically um, they always have an, uh, a woman light the candles before mass, always a woman and only a woman. There's a, one, that's one of the traditions that have, we've had in, in some parts. Anybody know why? Yeah, so remember, what's, who's the light represent? Jesus, right? We have two sides, so his human and his divine nature. So the light is Jesus, and who brought Jesus into the world? Mary, right? So, the, so a woman would light... The, bring the light into this assembly just like a woman first brought the light of the world into the world. So just a cool little um, teaching tradition, a good little reminder for us that everything we do should be pointing to a deeper truth that we believe in. And so that's just one of the traditions that pops up sometimes. Um, and I'll just, you know, good little side note. You wish that was the homily, but no. That's just, <laughs> we're just getting started. We're warming up here, you know. <clears throat> So we, are, we find ourselves the third Sunday of Advent. Advent is going very quickly. Next Sunday will be the fourth Sunday, and then all of a sudden Sunday night will be Christmas, you know? So we miss about a whole week here of Advent season. But um, in the third, this third weekend, we hear again the voice of John the Baptist. Uh, we heard him last Sunday, and now we have him again in his message, his proclamation this Sunday. And it's a little different this time because we have it from John. So John is giving us a little extra, some different details and some extra details, uh, and we, but we hear some of the same similar message, so we'll, we'll re do a little um, a recap and then also just show how today actually John brings, he doesn't just bring some same, same message from the past, but he has a little twist in, in there for, for us today. Uh, so his, his basic message um, comes out today, they're, they're looking, who are you? He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. So make straight the way of the Lord. The Lord is coming, God is coming. Get ready, prepare. That's been John's message, right? Prepare, because God is coming. Prepare to encounter him. Prepare for God to come into your life. And uh, we know his main, the number one way that John teaches us to prepare to encounter God is through that, that wonderful word we love, repentance. Repentance. So he says, I baptize you with water. Uh, it's a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins, but one is coming after me who's greater than I, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Uh, and so this baptism, this repentance that we're supposed to go through to help um, prepare to encounter God in a deeper way, a new way, a fresh way. And that word we always remember just, just means change. The, the very surface, literal definition of the word repentance in the Greek just simply means change. Change your mind, change your way of thinking, change your life, change the de desires of your heart, even change actions in your life. Uh, and so we did, just to get the full teaching of repentance, we have to always remind ourselves as Catholics, repentance is not just going to confession and saying sins. That's the first part, like admitting, okay, I did wrong, and here's what I did wrong. But the second half of repentance is the change part. What am I going to do different next time? So that I, what am I going to do different when I leave the confessional so that that shows or proves I'm actually changing? that I'm not going to do the same old sins week after week after week, that I have a plan, I have a strategy, so that the next time this temptation comes to think this way, I'm going to think that way. Next time, time this temptation comes to act this way, I'm going to act that way. Next time the temptation comes to speak a certain way, no, I'm going to speak this way instead. So the other, we have to have a conscious plan and strategy of, of change. Uh, if, if you're in the military, this should be easy for you. You know, you identify what's bad, the enemy, the sin, and you say, okay, we'll make a chain, we're going to make a plan, a strategy to destroy this, the enemy and, and, and how to 
get them out, right? If you knew there was an enemy in the United States, you'd, there'd be a plan and a strategy to go surround and attack and get the enemy, and then get them out of America. You have to look that way for your own life, right? Sin is an enemy. It's trying to kill you and trying to separate you from God for all eternity. We have to take it serious and make a plan of action that says, I'm going to change. This thing is getting out of my life. That's the concept of repentance. That's, when you think of repentance, think of John the Baptist shouting and spitting everywhere and just, you know, trying to wake us up and get us serious and say, change. We need change. God is coming. What do you need to change in your life so you're ready when God comes? Whatever it is, make it happen. So that's the first part of John's message that he's been repeating to us uh, week after week. And who knows how long he was out there, actually, you know, day after day and week after week professing this, this message. And he also was telling them uh, part of what we heard at the, near the end today, where he keeps repeating, there's one coming after me. He's mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. And in other words, John's saying, like, I'm not even worthy to touch the dirt on his feet. That's how unworthy I am. That's how great, much greater this person coming after me is compared to I. I'm not even worthy to touch the dirt on his feet. And so you know they're like, man, this person coming must be amazing. Probably like a kingly figure or a great political figure, somebody with an entourage, he's going to look important. Can't wait to see who this guy is. If John the Baptist, he can't even touch the dirt on his feet. And so that message he was saying week after week and day after day, you know, uh, one coming after me is mightier than I. But then today he's, he gives a little twist. Did you catch the twist today? Today he adds, this is different from the other Gospels, today he adds, one is coming after me, mightier than I, but actually he's already among you, and you do not recognize him. The one coming after me who's mightier than I, he's already among you, and you don't recognize him. Because he's not dressed up in a big kingly or stately appearance. He's just dressed like everybody else. And so you know, when he said this, he's already walking among you, but you don't recognize him. They're probably looking around, right? Who is he? Who's this guy? This kind of reminds me of uh, that TV show, like Undercover Boss, you know? The boss is here, but he's undercover. He, he, he was walking among you. You guys didn't even know. You know what you said to the boss the other day? It's on camera, you know, right? undercover boss. That's like Jesus. He's just walking around, checking it out before he reveals who he is. We can ask a similar question to ourselves that, that John was bringing to their attention. He, he's saying, he's already, God is already here. The Lord is already here among you, but you don't recognize him. And we can ask, you know, we know the Lord is also among us right now. Yeah, Jesus is coming again, his second coming at the end of time. He's coming again, but he's already among us now. And do we recognize him among us? Remember, we have, Jesus gives us those words, that teaching, I think it's in Matthew when he says, you know, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I will be among you. There's at least two or three of us here who are, are gathered in Jesus' name, we, so we know he is among us. And do we recognize him and his presence among us and in each and every person? That's the second place is to recognize not just Jesus among us, but we're different than John's crowd. We're different than even the disciples of Jesus in the sense that Jesus is not just walking among us as one person. He's actually... In true believers, he's actually in them. Not just with them, among them, but also in them. Remember Jesus promised in John 14 that, when, that he would ask the Father and the Father would send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would come and make his dwelling inside people. This is way different from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, he would come upon certain people, but not everyone. In the New Testament, Starting with Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside, not upon, but inside people. 
And then Jesus promised in that same, ver- that same chapter of 14, John 14, he says, whoever, uh, whoever loves me will obey my teaching, and I and the Father will come to them, and we will make our dwelling with them. That, that, actually, that literally means Jesus is going to come and move in, and, and, and we become his home. He's going to move in. He's going to put pictures up. You know, he's going to, like, rearrange and decorate stuff inside. Like, that's, that's what it literally means to come and make their dwelling inside of us. And so we have, want to ask, you know, do we not only recognize Jesus among us, but do we recognize Jesus within us? Do I recognize Jesus in me? Forget looking at your neighbor. Look at yourself, right? Do you recognize Jesus in you? The same Jesus you see in the Gospels. The same Jesus who right now is risen from the dead. He is glorified. He's up in heaven. He ascended to heaven. He's sitting on the right-hand side of the Father. He is glorified. He's got all power and all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to him. And he, all of that, is in you. This is like the, one of the most amazing mysteries that's revealed in the New Testament that Paul, he gets ecstatic about. In Colossians, he can't, he's just like, this is the greatest mystery ever of all the ages. Everybody in the Old Testament, all the old prophets longed to know this mystery, to understand this truth of what God was doing. And the mystery is this, Christ in you. What difference does Christ make in you? Because it's not just a metaphor, it's not just an image, it's not just a nice saying. Like, no, he really came and moved in your life. And what difference do you allow him to make in you? And do you and I recognize Jesus in us? Do I recognize Jesus in me? Literally, here's, our, here's your Advent assignment, you know? Maybe Christmas assignment, if you need more time. You could pick a gospel and do read through the gospel and take note of what you see Jesus doing and then write it down. What do you see Jesus saying and write down things that he says? What do you notice or recognize Jesus thinking and praying when he's talking to his father? And write it down. And then take those things that you wrote down that you saw in Jesus' life and now compare them to your life. The actions you wrote down that Jesus does, do you, do you see Jesus in you doing those actions? The words that Jesus spoke in the gospel, do you see Jesus, do you find Jesus speaking those same words through your mouth? The thoughts that Jesus thought and the way that he responded or talked with his father in prayer, do, do you have that, those same thoughts in your head? Do you have the same way of responding or praying to the father, relating to the father that Jesus did? Do you see Christ in you? Do you recognize the actions, the thoughts, the words of Jesus in your life, in your actions, in your words, in your thoughts? That's the best way, actually, to prepare for the second coming of Jesus is to simply recognize him in you now. And if you don't recognize him in you now, with his actions and his words and his thoughts, what are you going to do to change? What are you going to do, as John the Baptist would say, how are you going to repent? How are you going to change so that your life is the life of Christ? And the life of Christ is now your life. Because that is the difference. We're actually different than even the disciples. We don't even relate to the disciples in the Gospels. Because the disciples did not have Jesus in them. And we do. The only person we relate to in the Gospels is actually Jesus. He's the only person in the Gospels who, have, who has the Holy Spirit in him. And you and I have the Holy Spirit in us. It's a radical mind shift, ch- mindset shift and change that we have to make and realize we're definitely not Old Testament. We're, we're not even the disciples. We are only relate to Jesus. 
So how, do you, how, do, how does your life compare to Jesus? And that's the best way to prepare. One of the things that may come up for you that, that you may recognize is, boy, just maybe the way Jesus talks about peace in the gospel, the way he gives peace, and the way he, he seems to walk in peace and carry peace. And you say, well, the peace that Jesus has is different than, than, than most people experience in the world. Look at, think about the story of Jesus when he is out on the boat in the middle of the storm and the boat is sinking because the waves are going crazy and the wind is going crazy and the boat is sinking and Jesus is sleeping, huh? He's not just tired, he's, he's full of peace. He's not afraid that he's going to die. He has so much peace, he's not worried at all. And that's the kind of peace that he gives and brings to us when he comes and moves into us, is that peace that your, everything in, around you in your whole life could be chaos and stormy and, and trying to kill you. But inside, you are stable and rock-solid, unmovable. What's going on around you is not affecting within you. That's what Jesus offers and brings to us when he moves in. That's his peace. Actually, the word, we've said it before, I think, that that word peace literally means end of chaos and end to disorder. And a return to right order, a return to calm. And so if we allow God's peace to come, not just upon us, but to come within us, then what we're allowing to happen within our bodies and in our minds and our thoughts and our emotions is an end to chaos an end to disorder. And so that prayer, actually, peace is a, one of the best and most powerful prayers for healing. It's one of the most best blessings for healing that we can receive ourselves and offer to one another. Think about it when, we, when, I, when I come and I say, you know, good morning, beloved, peace be with you. Like, if, I, if I'm doing it right, then I'm actually sincere in what I'm saying, and I'm actually trying to give you peace. Peace be with you. The peace of Jesus be with you. That means an end of all chaos be with you. An, an end to any disorder in your life be with you. A return everything to right order and calmness be with you. All of that is coming when just simply saying peace be with you. And if you're conscious and, and open to it, you can receive that blessing, you can receive that healing, and you'll watch sometimes right in the moment, something will lift. Other times you'll notice that throughout the day, all of a sudden, things are clearing up, things are calm. If you prayed that, if you asked for God's peace to come within you and upon you, or if parents pray for peace upon their children as part of the night prayers before bed, when, when, that, when God's peace comes upon someone's mind, they sleep good. No nightmares. They're not up all night with, with, with worry, fear, anxiety. All of that goes away because order comes in with peace. You know, when you, you, you ask for peace upon yourself or you pray for peace, you can release peace on somebody else if you have God's peace on you to bring right order. Think about every, how many people suffer from bodily disorder, from bodily chaos, uh, just in the immune system. Anybody have an autoimmune disease or autoimmune disorder? It's a disorder. What fixes disorder? God's peace. God's peace ends disorder and brings in right order. Anybody have allergies? Allergies are immune system disorder. It's the immune system freaking out for no reason, right? It's the immune system overreacting to a little dog hair that's not going to kill me, but it thinks it is, so everything goes crazy, right? So what, what fixes disorder? God's peace. You can make that part of your daily prayer of peace. Daily, daily prayer. Lord, let your peace come up. I receive your peace on my immune system right now. Bring it back into right order. 
You know, you, get, you can even get fed up and say, immune system, you're going to act right today. Stop overreacting, you little drama queen, you know? Just go after that immune system. Tell yourself, act, act right. Get in order. Get in alignment with God's word of peace right now. That's, all that is, you got to have an attitude sometimes, you know? Get going, immune system. But this is anything. Any kind of, anytime you recognize chaos coming around, disorder, you know, things are out of whack, boom, that's a sign. Okay, I need God's peace. I need to get conscious and focus on God's peace. You know, whatever you focus on, you start to feel. That's a powerful truth. Whatever you focus on, you will feel. If you and I focus on God here, we will feel his presence. We will feel God. If you focus on fear, what are you going to feel? Fear. We know that. Huh? We, we've, we've all done that probably, most of us. Whatever we focus on, we will feel. If you recognize any disorder or chaos, or you just, man, you, need, you just say, I need God's peace. You gotta, the first thing is focus on it. God, I need your peace. I'm putting my attention on your peace right now. Let your peace come upon me right now. And you just keep your focus right on his peace. Your peace that ends chaos. Your peace that ends disorder. Your peace that brings everything back to right order, right integrity, calmness. You just keep that focus. Guess what? Pretty soon, what you're focusing on, you'll start to feel. So that's just one uh, example, one application of if you're going through the gospel and you're writing down things you see in the life of Jesus and then you're asking, do I recognize this in my life? That's one example. Okay, I see God's peace, Jesus is the peace that Jesus had. I want that in my life or I want more of that in my life. I recognize some, but I want more. And then you start to apply that and make little changes in your life to, to be more conscious recognizing that. And whatever you're focusing on, it will happen. You'll start to feel more of that and experience more of that in your life. All right, we're going long again. Let's stand in the, uh, oh, we have a baptism today.